Good morning. It's, it's great to be back with all of you. I, I grew up just 10 miles from here over uh, the Euless area. Uh, went to Trinity High School several decades ago. Anybody from that area? A few guys, yeah. And uh, Cal and I go back to Baylor. We were fraternity brothers at, at Baylor in the, in the early 80s. And we haven't seen each other in 35 years, so it's, it's so great to read. It was back in our pre-Christian days, so it's great to <laughs> shake our hands and actually <laughs> acknowledge that we see each other this time. So it's, it's awesome to be together. But before I start, can I just pray for you this morning? Lord, I thank you for these men. Thank you for what um, they're called to. Thank you for the vision you've given each one of them. Lord, I pray that just your joy would be their strength that you'd give them hope in their marriages, hope in their communities, Lord, that you would use them uh, in these days. As Chad said earlier, we we need men in our culture to change and transform the culture, Lord, and to change and transform the families and the churches, Lord. And I just pray that you'd use every man in this room, Lord, even this weekend, Lord, begin to use them in new and fresh ways and encourage them in all that you have for them. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen. So... I live in Nashville. I I made my way from Texas to Los Angeles, and I've been in Nashville now for 25 years. And a lot of my work uh, is in the entertainment industry, and a lot of the work that I do is in uh, Christian media and Christian music. So a lot of worship music that you've heard that's been generated both by artists and churches, I'm often the attorney representing them. And what that means is I'm handling their contracts, helping them decide who to partner with, who not to partner with helping to bring some protection to their copyrights and overseeing what they do. And so I I love what I do. I love to serve creative people. I love to serve creative ministries. And um, and I've been doing it now for, gosh, 30, 35 years and just love that part of of my work. Um, A couple, well, 10 years ago, back during, you guys remember 2008, the big uh, economic crash. You guys remember how how that felt? Well, right in that era, um, my missions pastor at my church got up in my face one morning and said, you're supposed to go to Nairobi with me next month. And I was like, yeah, no, thank you. Thank you anyway. Anybody ever been to Africa on a missions trip or otherwise? You've been there? Good. Um, We had some missionaries from our church that were doing a lot of work over there. And he said, I think you need to go with me. We got to just bring some comfort and encouragement to this missionary family. And, um, and I was just, I, the whole time he's telling me, I'm going, There's, that's, not, that's, that's not in the cards. I love support, supporting missionaries from the comforts of Nashville, but actually going to Nairobi and spending a week or two there was not what I was, felt like I was intended to do. But well, God had other plans, and next thing I knew, I was standing in um, the Kabira slum, the second largest slum in the world, a million people in one square mile. And it's, it's unbelievable. You step into it, to see that many people crowded in those circumstances, in little dung huts, uh, no roads, it's just all, it's, it's, it's red dirt, there's no sewage, uh, no electricity, um, and to see children and teenagers living in the most extreme poverty I've ever witnessed. And honestly, it was all those times when you kind of, you see poverty on television commercials and film and that sort of thing, and it, it sort of moves your heart. Um, Actually, actually, often it more moves your mind, I think, and you think that, but all of a sudden to step into that, and I remember this, even just the smell, I thought, I'm gonna, I, I didn't think I could keep from throwing up, just walking into the, the slum, and this ministry, this, these, this couple that we worked with were doing a, a ministry where they helped a lot of women, who most of whom husbands had long left them, who had lots of children, and most of them were HIV uh, positive, and so they were building a sewing ministry and helping these women. So we went back into the middle of the slum with a guide, because you, 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 you know, you, you're, it's a pretty dangerous area. A guide took us back in there. We went to one of the sewing uh, women's homes, and we walked in. It was a little 10 foot by 10 foot dung hut, no electricity. She lived there with the five children that she cared for. And um, plastic bags everywhere in the roads. That's basically, that's how people, that's the toilet, they call them flying toilets, so there, there's no sewage. And we stood there in the dark, and and the missionary introduced us, introduced uh, me and my friend and my missions pastor to a, a, a little orphan um, who just had lost her only living relative. And as we were getting ready to leave, they said, would you, Mark, would you pray for this little girl, eight years old? My son back home in Nashville is eight. And as I was walking in, I'm thinking, these shoes I'm wearing, these are not coming back to the United States. <laughs> these are done. 
And then I looked down at this little girl standing in all this filth, and she doesn't even have shoes on. And I remember putting my hand on her head and just no prayer would come out. It was one of those moments where just there was nothing. Finally, I, I muttered out some sort of prayer, walked out of that hut, back out in the sunlight, and just tears, my sunglasses were just covering my eyes, but I just remember tears just going, I have never seen something like this. I've never felt something like this. And I got back to Nashville, you know, a week later, and it just, it began to work in my heart. Well, the next thing you know, I'm up on the treadmill and starting to worry about taxes or something that was due. Some sort of financial thing in my head is kind of getting in there and just, you know, worrying about something. And all of a sudden, God took me back, just that kind of HD video in my mind, back to Nairobi, Kenya, back to the Kabira slum, back to that little hut, back to that little orphan girl and praying for her and putting my hand on her head. And I just broke. I just fell down on the floor of my, uh, upper, upstairs of my 4,500 square foot home in Nashville. And I just wept and cried probably longer and harder than I can ever remember. And in that moment, I was like, God, how can I ever doubt you that you would provide for me? You've taken care of me so richly. And in that moment, I think all of a sudden, God's heart for the orphan, and I use orphan broadly because often it's, 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 there's so many children that are orphans that don't have fathers. Uh, but the, God's heart for the orphan and the poor uh, is huge. And I think I finally, it went from my head to my heart. And, and I walked away from that moment in my, my house, and, and God just began to stir in me. And, I, and it was almost like I was born again, again. And that, that year, I think I lost 30 pounds. I just was wrecked. And I was like, going back to my law practice, I was like, I just, I can't, this is not enough. I want more. There's something more. So I began to think, God, would you call me to go join World Vision and, and work doing legal work for something, somebody like World Vision, maybe Compassion International, maybe International Justice Mission, something that's really doing effort in places like Africa. And it was interesting, that year, 2009, God began, in that process of praying, he began to just open up my wife's heart and my heart to a lot of young people. And it was interesting, all of a sudden, the youth group from our church wanted to use our house for events, and they started coming over. We began to sort of connect with different teenagers and a single mom and others, and we'd have them over for Monday night dinners. Um, we had different people who were moving to Nashville that didn't really have families, didn't really have fathers, that we invited to live with us. And we, we ended up, over the next course of the years, we had, I think, three or four different teenage girls that lived with us. And it's all of a sudden our hearts and our, we sort of were in that age where our, our, our kids were still eight, and 11, but we just began to invite all these other young people into our lives. And sort of, I, you know, you sort of guard that family time, and all of a sudden, but we just saw that God was opening up our lives to, to others in, in a bigger way. That year, I began, God just put on my heart in a profound way to begin uh, being a professor at Belmont, and just miraculously, next thing you know, I was standing before a class of college students. I've been a professor there now uh, for over eight years, and I'm there every Tuesday, Thursday night. And it's, been, it's become one of the most fulfilling parts of my life. I say I'm a, a missionary disguised as a professor, because even though Belmont has Christian roots, I'd say 60% of the kids coming there are not, are not Christian. And so many of them come from just messed up homes, messed up dads, messed up relationships. And so my wife and I have seen, starting with that little moment in Kabira, this all of a sudden, this opportunity of all these different ways to disciple and mentor and serve young people in just very natural ways. And it's funny, I kept thinking I was going to have to move across the world to do that. And then God showed me a year later, he said, no, it's just 22 miles from your house. Driving up to Belmont on Tuesday, Thursday nights uh, to teach in their music business school and to pour into kids' lives it was, just a, it was just a few miles away. Um, and so it's been interesting to see um, the last 10 years, I felt like we went from having two children to now we've had dozens and dozens and dozens of spiritual children in our lives. And it's been, it's been natural and it's been a blessing. It's been a blessing to my own children. Um, and so it's interesting, I, I just wanna talk a bit about my experience at Belmont because what I'm, the kind of the theme I'm gonna speak on from here on out is really birthed out of my time in the classroom with my students. And that time that I have having coffee 
uh, and, and sitting across the table. from that, That's where it all happens. You have the time in the classroom, you lecture, you build relationship, you build maybe some community, but then having that opportunity to sit with a, with a college student over coffee after class at night, that's where it all happens. That 30 minutes, and I, and I go into those meetings saying, God, use me. Show me how to serve this young man or this young woman in a powerful way. I've got 30 minutes. This might be the only time that I have with them, but use me. And that's so fulfilling. But what, as I've sat there so many times, I often hear this question. They're, they're trying to figure out what, what are they going to do with their career? You know, what are they going to do with maybe their music? They want to become a songwriter or, or an artist. Or maybe they've got a dream for a new business they're going to start. So we talk a lot about what does it mean to be successful? What, what does it mean to, after you got out of college, what's it going to mean to you to feel like your life has been worthwhile? So I ask you guys this morning, just e even from your own experience and what you think that either the world says or what you believe, how would you define success for yourself? Just a few of you. What would, what would, what would yes? Happiness. Happiness? Yeah, it's good. A couple more? Yeah. It's good. It's good. Fulfilling his assignment for your life. That's good. Yeah. Same thing? It's good. It's good. It's good. Others? That's good. <laughs> it's good. Yes, sir. It's good. It's good. Love it. And how about a few that maybe, maybe even beyond just your view as a, as a Christian person, what would the world tell you that success would be? Money. Money. Good. More. Fame. Fame. Yeah. Legacy. It's good. Comfort. Comfort. Power. Power. Yeah. Reputation. Yeah. Reputation. Relationships. Good. Status. Status yeah. Influence, business success, maybe building a business, having, you know, being financially well off. Yeah, those are all things that, I, 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 again, uh, it's interesting. Um, we can all look at success from different viewpoints. The, the, the common denominator that I see these days, and I know a lot of you men see it in, in business and different things you're doing, but the, and I'm hearing it all the time. I have students step into school the very first day of class a lot of professors will say to them, okay, you're a freshman, you got four years, but if you want to be successful when you graduate, if you want to find the job, if you want to start building your career, you got to start networking. Anybody ever hear anybody say that? Yeah. It's all about networking. It's all about who you know. And what happens is, I see a lot of students, they become paralyzed with this, this whole theme of networking. First of all, they don't know what it really means. And then secondly, a lot of them are introverts. Maybe they're not gifted at going out and doing that. And so there's a lot of pressure to go out and make something happen. And when I say networking, let me just define that for you. Um, I, would, I would define it as networking as the cultivation of relationships that can help you advance or move to a higher position. So basically the message is, and I think for so many of those areas of success, the message is for anything you do in life, whether it's marriage, whether it's business, whether it's you know, uh, finding a job upon college graduation, the way to achieve it is through networking. And now you've got podcasts, you've got self-help business books. That's the message of so many of those people, right? So I think there's problems with that, with that concept. It's one of the things that Chad mentioned earlier. There's things that networking kills. Number one, it, it kills authentic relationships. I mean, I've heard people say, here's a couple of quotes from my students. They'll say, I've always hated the idea of trying to meet people for the sole purpose of personal gain, but I've reluctantly believed that it's the only way to make a career happen. But other people say, those organized networking events are very disingenuous. The few I've gone to feel very cheap and I feel like I'm being completely selfish. See, we all, need, we all need real relationships, not fake ones. And I think networking actually kills life and it kills our love towards others. When I ask my students what they feel, how they feel about it, they hate it. They say it's, 
disgusting, it leads to rejection, it leads to insecurity. But see, the real problem, it's not about just going out and meeting pe with people, which is, can be a really good thing. It's really about our heart and motivation. Why are we going to connect with people? And there was a recent study, there was a Harvard psychologist that did a recent study in uh, 2014 that actually showed that people that go to these professional networking events to meet with people, they actually leave and they feel morally impure and they feel physically dirty. They, they, they refer to the physical dirtiness as the Macbeth effect. Remember in Shakespeare's Lady Macbeth, she's trying to wash that imaginary blood off of her, off of her hands. So there's, uh, there is a psychological problem with it, right? But I think there's actually a spiritual problem. Um, because networking, when you're going out to use someone else for your own, for your own purpose, whether it's business or whatever, um, it contradicts God's identity in us. His identity is about sacrifice. It's about serving. It's about generosity, right? So let me just say something. Let me touch on what I believe is God's message for success that really contradicts the whole networking mentality. And I think a great example is what Jesus taught. Remember when uh, Salome came to him with James and John? She was kind of the ultimate stage mom. She brought the two young teenage boys and said to, to Christ, Jesus, I want my sons to be in the highest place of honor in your kingdom, one on your right and one on your left. And Jesus was like, whoa, he was kind of taken aback. And he says, I don't think you understand what you're asking, right? And what did he say? He said, whoever wants to be great or a leader must be a servant. So my argument for you today is that networking does not equal success. That ultimately serve it. serving is what equals success. He taught us that serving is not only the path to success, it is success. And the great news is this is for all of us, right? Martin Luther King Jr. has a great quote. He said, anybody can be great because anybody can serve. And even Paul, Paul, summar Paul summarizes the entire word of God in the Bible with one statement. He said, and this is a commandment to us. He says, for everything we know about God's plan for man is summed up in a single sentence, love others, as you love yourself. That's an act of true freedom. I, somebody showed me a podcast last week, which I thought was really fitting for this group. There's a guy named Simon Sinek, and in one of his podcasts, he, he has a quote which really compares what I'd say is this whole service mentality with uh, what you often see in terms, of, in terms of business. He said, in the military, they give medals to people who are willing to sacrifice so that others might gain. In business, though, we often give bonuses to people who are willing to sacrifice others that we might gain. See, the heart, of, the heart of networking is rooted in selfishness, taking and using, while Christ teaches us that true success comes through serving, through generosity, and loving others without reservation. And so you gotta see that the, 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 the culture, the business culture, the networking culture, it's big business. You know, LinkedIn, all the different avenues for that. But it's really the, often the polar opposite of what, what, uh, what Christ taught. I was meeting and mentoring a, a young uh, executive recently, and he was talking about moving to a new company. And uh, we were in my office, and he's like, you know, I've been at this company, all these great things are happening, but this, this other company, they've made me a bigger offer, they're offering more money. And he kept saying in our conversation, yeah, I just think this new company's gonna be a great place for, for, for me to grow. He said that four or five times. He just kept saying, yeah, I just, I just see my long-term growth. I'm gonna really see benefit at this new company. And I said, that's great, and, and I really can respect that. But I said, ultimately, I think your question needs to be, is this new company gonna be a great place for you to serve? And is your assignment to serve at the current company, is it actually coming to an end? He's like, man, I, he, goes, I don't, he goes, and he's a Christian. He goes, I don't even know why I'm not even thinking that way. I said, you've got to begin to shift your thinking about where you are based on where God has you serving, not on, on whether it's going to be a great place for you to grow. Um, so it, it's not about you. 
It's always about others, whether it's your workplace, your school, your sphere of influence. Here's just a couple of, I just want to give you a few examples on serving, because I think it'll give you just some broader thinking about the benefits not only to you, but to those around you. Um, this is one that I love because it really applies to me even standing before you right now today. I think serving erases the fear of failure. Okay? So a lot of the, a lot of the creatives that I uh, mentor and that I provide legal work for, a lot of them are entering into being on the stage. They're singing songs, they're doing things. And so there's a lot of stage fright, there's a lot of fear of bombing at, at live shows. And I'll, I'll counsel them, I say, listen, you've got to begin to learn to see the stage as a place of love and service. You're there, God's given you amazing gifts. He's given you songs that no one else has written. He's given you a voice that no one else has. And once you see the stage as a place of service, right? Not as a place where you're receiving affirmation and encouragement, but you see it as a place of service and you're focused on your audience, giving them that gift that's gonna transform them, it's gonna make them it's going to just bring joy, it's going to bring happiness, it's going to bring comfort, it's going to bring empathy to their lives, then, then there is no fear, right? The fear is gone because it's about them, it's not about you. So it's, you got to see the power of that gift, that creative gift that God's given you, make that your focus, not finding your identity in the applause. Then the spotlight becomes a place of, a place of love instead of a place of fear with the risk of failure. So that's for all of us, whether you're making a business presentation, whether you're uh, standing up in front of a group like this, you step into that saying, I'm called to bring something to those before me. So the fear of failure is gone, it, it evaporates. Um, serving erases conflict. When your work is done with care, compassion, humility and prayer, conflict is erased. Often I find myself dealing with high-powered attorneys in New York and Beverly Hills. And those, they don't think too kindly of us from the South. So they think I'm from Nashville. This guy didn't know what he's doing. They're very dismissive. And uh, so I'll step into those situations and it's easy. Some of those guys, you know, they're making $800 an hour for their legal work. And they went to the, you know, Harvard or Yale or wherever they went. Um, you know, and they're sharp, they're sharp. But you could step into those situations and be intimidated, right? But you step into those situations and recognize this gentleman I'm on the phone with right now, he doesn't even have hope of eternal life right now. There's one, there's one man I deal with, he, his wife works for the Playboy Channel in Los Angeles, and he thinks that's, he thinks that's a, great, it's a great thing. And um, but I'll step into a meeting like that, and instead of being intimidated, begin to have compassion, begin to pray for him. And all of a sudden, you can be in that midst of that conflict with someone in a business setting like that, where you think this is never gonna get resolved, you begin to pray for that person. Sometimes, again, you may not be able to pray for them on the phone, they may not be someone who would receive that, but you pray for them, and you begin to serve them in your heart, then all of a sudden the conflict evaporates. So instead of putting the box, you can be, want to put the boxing gloves, but all of a sudden you really treat that person with care and humility and compassion, all of a sudden you'll see the log jam just removed from that relationship. Serving creates purpose. A couple of years ago, um, my son was looking for his first job. He just got his, we, we'd given him my old uh, clunker car, so he's trying to figure out how he's gonna put gas in that car, so he's talking about different jobs. And um, I said, well, hey, have you thought about the, the grocery store Publix down there? He said, oh, Dad, that would be so boring. I said, well, what about uh, Chick-fil-A? Everybody loves working at Chick-fil-A, right? He's like, Dad, boring. And so we just went on, everyone was boring, 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 boring. And I said, listen, Harrison, you gotta get a different vision for your life. You gotta see that whatever job you have, and any job you have in the future, it's not about you getting your emotional needs met. It's about you looking at that environment and going, God, have you given me something to step into that environment to be able to serve? It's really about who's there for you to give to. See, there's no dream job. There really isn't. There's no perfect job. But serving can create purpose and contentment that can make even the most boring or the worst job still feel like a dream. Serving creates value for you and for others. And right now we live in a world where you can be famous for being famous. A few years ago I went to a music convention down in Austin 
with the sole purpose of getting new clients. I had my business cards, I was connecting with everybody. Um, came back, came back to Nashville, spent probably $2,000 in hotel and you know, conference and everything. But came back to Nashville, waiting for the phone to ring. Crickets, nothing. God said, did you ask me about going to Austin for that conference? I was like, no, sir. <laughs> and, and while you were there, did you care about the people you met? You, you were around people that were drunk and broken and lonely and all this. And how much did you care and really serve those people that were around you? I said, man, I, did, I missed it. I'm so sorry. And, and he, he, he taught me right then and there, you go to places like that, not just to promote yourself and gain business, but you're going with your head on a swivel where you're going and looking for those to, to serve. Um, I was trying to make myself visible. That's what everyone teaches you, right? That's what networking is all about. It's going to make yourself visible. God wants us to make ourselves available. That's the key. And then giving value lasts. Serving creates provision for you and for others. Serving gives and attracts while networking takes and repels. The best marketing plan for your product or business comes through genuine love, generosity, and care for others. And when you build relationships on those things with no strings attached, you actually open up a, a flow of provision that flows both ways. I've seen it again and again. I've seen it I had a, a, a gentleman years ago who could not afford to pay me for legal work. I began to do work, work for him for free because I believed in him. I desired to serve him. I didn't know what would happen. Five years later, he became the highest billing client that I'd ever had in the history of my law practice. And it was one of those moments where I, I sowed. I didn't know what would happen, but God took care of me. It came, it, it, it came back. Um, one of the things I know you guys value, and I just want to emphasize too, is serving builds an eternal legacy. I challenge you today, begin to see what God's placed in you as men, as fathers, beyond your children. Some of you, I know your children have probably grown. Well, you know what? There's more children for you. There's spiritual children. There's young men. I know I am who I am today because of the men, who, the leaders, and the pastors, and the attorneys that have poured into me. So begin to see your life. Part of your legacy is not just your natural children, but it's the young men and the young women that you're going to pour into. As you serve them, you're going far. You're going further. There's a scripture um, from the psalm that says, Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. And again, I think that goes beyond just our natural children. That's the, that's the ones that we step into, the ones that have not had good fathers, the ones that need mentoring. And again, like that arrow, they're going to go farther and they're going to go faster than us and they're going to pierce more darkness in our lives. And that's something that you can be proud of. And lastly, serving changes the world because it changes others. We all want to leave a mark, don't we? We want to, we want to, we want to leave something behind that changes the world. Oftentimes we feel like, I don't have enough education. I don't, I don't have the right network. I don't have all the resources. But I just encourage you, it's, you start small. You start with one. Whenever I get discouraged at Belmont, sometimes I'm like, am I doing enough? Am I, am I serving enough of these students uh, in the right way? And my wife always gets in my face. She goes, it's one student at a time. It's one person at a time. And so I say that to you today. It's one person at a time. Start small. Start with one. And then there's more. But there's a multiplication effect. You don't need a license to change someone. You just need to care. In a world filled with hate and disconnection, serving astounds the world. It really does. And then one last point I want to make on this is that recognize that telling others the story of Christ, not only his story, 
but his story in your life is the ultimate act of serving. It's really the mark of our true love for others. Dietrich Bonhoeffer calls it the most charitable and merciful act that we can perform. So, in the words of the great philosopher Ferris Bueller, <laughs> life moves pretty fast. And God calls us to redeem the time. You know, Moses, the one psalm that Moses wrote, he said, um, Lord, help me to redeem my days that I might gain a heart of wisdom. So it's important to recognize we have limited time. That one coffee with someone that you're having this weekend or lunch, that might be the last time you're with them. Don't miss the opportunity to serve them. Don't miss the opportunity to share Christ with them. Don't miss the opportunity to share uh, just compassion and just pouring out his love on them. Um, so ask, ask yourself this question today as, as, as we close. Who in your world needs the life-saving knowledge and power of Christ? Who are you supposed to serve today and this week? And I encourage you as you go from here, acknowledge the places of servant. Even as you're thinking right now, I'm sure there's things coming to your mind going, this is something, this is a person I need to connect with more. This is a this is a place I need to serve more. Begin to let God stir those things in you. Repent of the things that we've missed, but then let him stir those things into you. And then, as you go, so many of you talked about it, listening for God's assignment in your life. What are those assignments? So often we pursue our dreams and our plans and our purposes, but be willing to say, God, what are your plans and your assignments for me, and who are those people that I'm supposed to serve? So, thanks for letting me be with you today. Appreciate it.